Good morning and welcome to Lighthouse Baptist Church. We're so glad to have you with us. Thanks for staying, staying with us and maybe some others are joining us here this morning. God bless you and happy Mother's Day. We around here we call it Ladies' Day. Uh, we, we, uh, I'm just so glad the Lord made ladies. How about you? It says, not good for a man to be, uh, be alone, and we certainly need our ladies. And uh, I'll talk about that in a little while here, but we're just glad to have you with us. God bless you. And uh, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll begin our time together. Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to meet together in spirit, and, and thank you so much again for the folks who are, who are, are helping us to live stream these uh, serv services to everyone, and thank you for their faith, faithfulness and Lord, I thank you for the faithfulness of our folks and the ones who have given to the ministry here. And uh, Lord, you've just been, they've just been so uh, sweet and, uh, and faithful to us and to you. And Lord, we thank you for that. And pray, Lord, now that you bless our time. I uh, know this, this, this is a difficult time, and there's a lot of, as Brother Nathan was saying, loneliness during a time such as this. And we're asking, we, you know, we're trying to serve the Lord, and yet we're not necessarily getting the, uh, uh, the, the, the social feedback that we want. And, uh, and the relationships, and those times can be difficult. But yet, Lord, we know that you are faithful, and you never leave us nor forsake us. And you are in that still, small voice. And thank you that we can have that still, small voice in us. And, uh, Lord, I pray for those who are in the hospital, some other things. We've, we've talked about on Wednesday. Wednesday there's uh, several folks who've had some procedures done and some folks who have some things coming up. And Lord, I pray to protect them, put a hedge protection around them, watch over them, help them to uh, heal up and get back on their feet. And Lord, put a protection around our folks. And, and there have been, been a few folks who have been acquainted with our ministry that have come down with this virus. And, and so far, so good. They're getting over it and doing well. And Lord, I pray that you'll meet with those needs. And some I haven't heard back from for a little bit, so we need to check on those. But Lord, we th again, we just thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and our lives and for speaking to the hearts of the people of our, our community and around the world, our nation. People are being drawn to you, and Lord, I pray that you'll use these times. These are great opportunities to, to uh, present your, your Son as safe, Savior. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll bless us. Help us during these hours, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Just uh, want to say I appreciate you being here. If you're visiting with us, uh, there's a little place on the website there. If you got on the Facebook, you can go back to the website there. You can see it says New Here. You click down on the page there. You, you click on New Here, and you have a little place, a little form you can fill out. And uh, if you would, we would like to send you a little book called Done. And of course, our faith is, is a done religion. Lord has everything fiddle, finished for us. We don't have to, listen, we, we serve out of gratitude. But as far as the salvation, what could you add to the, to the, to the death of your only, the only begotten Son of God? How can you add anything to that? It's finished. It's complete. And in fact, you said it's finished. And so I want to encourage you to do that. And uh, for those, uh, just, just a reminder, of course, we're 9.30, 10.30, 6 o'clock tonight. We'll be back 7 o'clock on Wednesday. And uh, if you would like to stay up to date on what's going on, in fact, you might want to do that because things are going to, you know, we have, Lord willing, we're going to be opening up here soon. And, and uh, you may want, want to know some information, some last-minute things. And if you would like to do that, you, have a, you, have a, you can make, a, you can do text, tec texting on your phone. If you would detect the little message, the at sign, LBC Dover, at LBC Dover, text that message, that's the message, to the, the phone number, if you will, of 81010, 81010. So that's the phone number. I know it sounds a little strange. If you text that, you, you can, and then it's a few little steps there, and you can be part of our reminder from the church, and you will get little reminders from time, time to time of things going on, not so you don't miss anything. It's going to be a wonderful thing to help us out, and then you'll get some other messages and so forth. So I encourage you to do that. Youth of Blaze, of course, are Wednesday night at 7 p.m. on their Facebook, LBC Youth of Blaze. Lighthouse Kids Club are having their program. Had a few, few more done this week, and so kids, stay up, up to date on those. It's right on the website there. You can do, go over to the little blue button that says Lighthouse Kids Club, and uh, there's, there's some programs. In fact, I've seen, I've heard, I, I've had folks who were telling me they've been watching the uh, the live stream services, but they've been going over and watching the, the children's serv services as well and getting been, been blessed by that. And so I encourage you to do that. Uh, prayer sheet, if you would like to be on our prayer sheet, it goes out every Wednesday. In fact, we'll probably use this to send out bulletins for Sunday morning, uh, at least for a while. And so if you'd like to keep up to date on those kind of things, write that to info at lighthousebap.org, info, I-N-F-O, at lighthousebap.org and request to be on the uh, bulletin 
uh, e email list. And, of course, you can send pr prayer requests in on that or call the church office at 717-292-5000. Also, the Zoom uh, sa Saturday morning Zoom meeting is at, at 10 o'clock, and you can contact Pastor Gaskill at uh, bgaskill at lighthousebap.org, and you can get on that list, and we, we can get you a little code there, and you can join us on Saturday mornings for that. Lighthouse Christ Christian School is coming up, and uh, we're preparing and if we have, you know, at this point, we want, to, we want to know whether we need to hire more staff or whether we don't. We were kind of thinking we were going to be a little higher this year. I don't know. We have no idea. We don't know where folks' uh, uh, fi finances are and so forth. And, and uh, we are filling up for what we had last year. And so if you would like to be part of that, we, we uh, would really encourage you to go ahead and contact us at the church at 717-292-5000 or email us at LCS, Lighthouse Christian School, LCS at lighthousebap.org. And again, we appreciate the faithfulness of our folks and had someone give, give me a, a whole stack of back, uh, uh, the, of, uh, of offering envelopes here just, just, just this morning and appreciate our folks being faithful. And you can do that. You can mail them into the church at 5005 Carlisle Road, Dover, Pennsylvania, 17315. Of course, you can find that address on the website. Or you can go right on the website and do undergo under give, and you can help help you do that as well. Um, I want to uh, uh, give you a little update on some things. Oh, by the way, if um, uh, let's see, you all been let's see, I got those. All right, we got those. The uh, the uh, extra print, print principal has been get, being uh, given to to the expansion fund. The post been faithful, bless their hearts, and uh, so we have had more given to the. Expansion fund. At this point, we have had 112,000 extra given, and we have saved 181 over 181,000 in uh, interest. And so we're actually 299,000 dollars ahead. And I appreciate that. And about two and a half years ahead on the, on the pay, payments. And what, what a blessing that is. I am considering very seriously about uh, opening up church services in two weeks, May 24th. Um, now, I don't know what will happen between now and then. If things become worse, that may have to go out the window. So another reason I have that little texting thing. But you stay up to date. We'll have it on the web website, and we will try to get notice to you. But uh, we will do so, and I'm going to say this, and, and I hope you'll take it the right way, at your own risk. Now, we're going to do everything we can to make this a safe place at the, to be. We will be dealing with, uh, we have some other things coming in, some, of course, uh, 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 hand, hand sanitizer sta stations are going to be put in around the, uh, the building here. And, uh, of course, we'll do social dis distancing, and we will, we will fill up this room. We're also going to have uh, live stream to other rooms where you can, if it gets too, bit too full in here, we can move to other, and again, socialize. We need a little bit of socialization, even if it's across the room from six feet away. And uh, so we will be doing some things to tend to those things. And, of course, there is going to be some inconvenience, and we may be overkill, may we not be overkill, but at least until we get in place in the, each morning, um, we'll be asked you to come in with your masks on, and then once you kind of get separated in the building, we, we may be able to loose, loosen that a little bit, but we'll see what we need to do. We do not want to put anybody at risk unnecessarily. On the other hand, I do know that there's a lot of folks who would like to be here and we want, to be able to, we want to be able to provide that. Of course, we also have a team of folks who will come through and sanitize after each, serv ser each service and uh, make sure it's safe for the next group. Probably be doing two services, 9.15 to 10.15, one hour, and then again from uh, 10.30 to about 11.30 and, uh, so that we don't have to, uh, so people can get in and get out. Uh, we will probably have uh, one-way traffic through the building Again, so we're not meeting up with each other. And again, it may seem like overkill right now at this point, but we want to do everything we can to make it safe, see how it goes, and then if we can, if we can uh, uh, relieve some, some of those stringent uh, policies, we will do so as soon as we can. And so I want you to kind of be thinking about that. You pray about that. I was asking, to the, asking the gentleman. Uh, we will have nursery room available, but that would be for some place for, for the for for our parents to take their chil children if they were to get uh, restless. We won't be ha actually having nursery 
services, if you will. Uh, but we will have a hostess back there who will tend to the uh, parents and other things and make it as, as uh, reasonable as, as we can and still be safe. And uh, so I want to encourage you to kind of put that in the back of your, your mind and kind of pray toward that end. And we hope we can make that work. Also, uh, we will be, um, I don't know how soon we'll get to use them, but uh, real soon here we'll be, uh, the, the new hymn books are coming in and uh, we're, we're excited about that. And so we will be updating those and while we're gone, some other things you'll find out. Got folks who want to join the church and other things. Just glad to have them. And just so glad that for you to be with us. I've asked Brother Nathan to uh, sing for us. Yesterday was his birthday. And uh, I, I, I think at 26, is that right? 26, man, more than a quarter of a century old. And I uh, uh, appreciate that. And, of course, actually, yesterday actually was pa Pastor Brandon Gaskill and, and Miss Esther's uh, uh, anniversary, wedding anniversary. And I guess that's five years, five years, a whole handful. And uh, five years and three kids, boy, whew, man. And uh, that's okay. I had their grandkids. I appreciate it. And so congratulations to them as well. Bro Brother Nathan, you come and preach and, uh, and uh, put, sing for us, and then we'll have our message. While the storm howls above me And there's no hiding place Mid the crash of the thunder Precious Lord, hear my cry Keep me safe Till the storm passes by Times Satan whispers, There is no need to try. There is no end of sorrow. There's no hope by and by. But I know you are with me, and tomorrow I'll rise. Where the storms never darken. They never darken the skies Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace And over all victorious in His bright increase And if I stay upon Jehovah, my heart is fully blessed and finding as he promised perfect peace and rest when the long night has ended and the storms come no more let me stand in thy presence on that bright, peaceful shore. In that land where the tempest never comes, Lord, may I dwell with thee till the storm passes by. Because every joy or trial falleth from above. Traced upon our dial by the Son of Love. And we may trust Him fully, all for us to do. And may you trust Him wholly, find Him wholly true. Till the storm passes over, Till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe, keep me safe. 
keep me safe. And if I stay upon Jehovah, my heart is fully blessed. And finding as he promised, perfect peace and Perfect peace and rest till the storm passes by. Amen. Very appropriate uh, song for the days that we're living in. Amen, amen, amen. I would like to uh, kind of raise the flag for all our ladies. We always, you know, we actually usually have a gift and everything for everybody and uh, didn't I didn't plan that way because I, I knew we weren't going to have everybody here with us, but um, I always appreciate our ladies. You know, the world would be, uh, world would be a, a mess without our ladies, I tell you that. Uh, it's not good for man to be alone. And uh, there's a special, uh, special uh, way about the ladies that um, just makes life a little sweeter, a little nicer, uh, warmer, uh, just uh, t- kinder, gentler, and... Uh, the nurturing that they do, and just appreciate it, and and uh, you know, give 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 your mom a call or a wife or uh, get extra kiss, and your 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 grown daughters and all those, and your aunts, and and uh, just uh, wave their flag a little bit. Just appreciate so much, our ladies. And uh, today, I want to I want I want I want you to turn in your Bible to First Samuel chapter twenty five. 1 Samuel chapter 25, and we're going to kind of see this a little bit, how um, the, um, it is with, uh, with ladies. I, uh, actually, I think Miss Amy Meyer in her ladies' Bible study was out on this passage this week, and uh, I, I had planned on this. I wrote this down on, for this, uh, this sun, Sunday, man, months and months and months ago, and then I Heard she spoke on it for the ladies' Bible study, which, by the way, uh, that's also on the website there. If you'd like to be part of that ladies' Thursday morning Bible study, uh, one, I'm sorry, afternoon, one fifteen, Thursday, Thursday afternoon Bible study for ladies. You can get into that, and that's a Zoom, is that a Zoom meeting? And um, I wasn't there. I'm a lady, I'm not a lady, but uh, uh, I heard it was good, and so I, I you know, want to encourage your ladies to be part of that. Uh, and you, of course, you. Uh, Anybody, any, any of the ladies can be part of that. We want to encourage you to do so. And, uh, and she worked on this uh, particular passage out of 1 Samuel 25. And uh, I had to, I've tried to decide what I wanted to call this message. I ended up with three different titles for the thing. And uh, uh, one was uh, a warm-hearted woman and two hot-headed men. And uh, I thought, well, though I'll be a little more uh, academic and... Uh, and I, I thought, well, I'll call it Conflict Resolution in Tense Times. And uh, uh, I don't know. It didn't do it. So I decided we're going to go with a rose between two thorns. And uh, so we're going to talk about a rose between two thorns this morning. And uh, let's have a word of prayer. And then we're going to walk through this passage and uh, pretty well through the whole chapter. Not quite, but just just, just about. So I'm going to roll on there. Don't, if I don't want to... Uh, read it ahead of time, I'll get ahead of myself, but um, let's go ahead and, and we'll walk through this passage. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house, and Lord, these are tense times, and we get uh, closed up in a small place with just a few people, the same people, and, and uh, Lord, these, besides all the worry and the cares that's going on in the world, and you uh, watch the news, and you wonder if we're going to make it another day, and we're isolated and confined and wonder when in the world we're going to get out and after a while the uh, this person we love uh, can become a little bit uh, agitating and and all these kind of things go into hearts and lives and, and contention comes up and tempers may flare and or we just need to walk with you when, and so Lord really with the fruit of the spirit it really shouldn't be a problem but it's amazing how these things can come up. And Lord, we do thank you for our mothers. And, and I know some folks didn't have the 
the privilege and the blessing of a loving mother. I understand that. I mean, somebody gave birth to them, but they may actually have felt a little abandoned. And uh, Lord, give them grace at this time as well. But we know that uh, overall your design was a perfect design. Though sin makes things difficult sometimes. And I'll just thank you, though, for our mothers and for the ladies, whether they ended up having children or not. Lord, we thank you for our ladies. And Lord, it's just a blessing the way you have, have uh, blessed the world, put this all together in a perfect way, in a perfect design. And may you give them a special blessing, know that they're loved. Lord, speak to our hearts here now this morning. Give us exactly what we need. May we see ourselves in the Word of God and not walk away being a forgetful, a forgetful hearer and uh, see ourselves so that we may become more like you. Thank you for what you're doing in our hearts here today. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Now, I've often said that, uh, you know, we, we can uh, tell what a person is made of by what comes out when they're squeezed. Uh, when the heat is on, when the pressure is on, I find our true selves are most often revealed. I, I, don't, I don't recommend this, but uh, when I was a boy in elementary school, I remember when they finally got ketchup packets in the cafeteria. And uh, it didn't take long till somebody stepped on it, one of those ketchup packets. One fell on the floor and they stepped on it. Well, we know what happened. It squirted all over the shoe of the boy next, next to him. And, uh, well, that gave us an idea. And so, you know, I mean, you know, what a bunch of 10-year-old 10, 10, 10, 10 boys, what the first thing you need to do is see who can make it squirt the furthest. And so we're, you know, you lay those things down and, you know, you squeeze on that thing and see what you can do. And, of course, you know, it, uh, it was really cool for a little bit. Later in the principal's office, uh, we found out that uh, that's, the ketchup packets weren't for stepping on. And uh, it, it, it seemed to work really well. You know, some of them, you know, they took them out on, the, out on the, play, the playground. They used to stick a few in their pockets and see how far they could make them shoot and all this kind of stuff. And, and, uh, but my point being, you know what came out of those pockets when you stepped on them? Ketchup. Because that's what's inside the packet. And when we get squeezed and we get under the heat, what comes out of you is what's on the inside. Now, during these days of a stay-at-home, shelter-in-place order, we're often in close quarters with just a few people, and it can be 24-7. And I'll be surprised, I'm kind of surprised how many folks mention that extended time with their spouses has caused them much stress. Now, people talk about how much work marriage is. I'll be honest with you. I'm, I knew I was going to be too lazy to work on a marriage, so I had to make sure I married somebody that I already agreed with. And uh, so I did. And, uh, in fact, we were, we were dating. kind of like we, every once in a while we look, we, we look at each other and say, why doesn't everybody think like the way we think? But Because uh, we think so much alike. But I understand there can be times when uh, it can be tense. Now, now all, we all, all of us have quirks. Except me. I mean, I don't have quirks. I'm a normal one. But everybody has quirks. And uh, we have a choice. And we, we can allow these idiosync idiosyncrasies to get under our skin, or we can just accept them the way they are. And when we decide not to accept folks the way they are, we're setting ourselves up for disappointment. We're also deciding that we know about someone else's life and how they should be acting and what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing. And, and we can be full of pride. And, the, and, of course, the Bible says only by pride cometh contention. And so you get into a small place and the pride starts showing up and we start deciding what we need to do. Contention shows up. Now, contention in the home can be anything from who sits where in the, in the room or who, who's eating what for dinner or or who, or how, how, how you put the the uh, to toilet paper on the on the pool, uh, the toilet pa paper roll, that is if you have toilet paper. Now, people have been literally murdered by family members, or over who ate the last steak, or who did this, or who do that, who did that, who left the who left the door. I mean, it's crazy the way people can be can 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 be. 
Now, having a happy home is no great, deep, dark secret. It simply requires us, if nothing else, to live a spirit-filled life. I mean, it could be tough at times. But the, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and goodness and gentleness and meekness and faith and temperance. That's self-control. Temperance is not just about staying away from alcohol. But by the way, stay away from alcohol because that will also probably do some crazy things to you. You will do things that you would have never thought you would have done when you get, when, when, and as old uh, uh, Otis used to say in Andy Griffith, when you got a snoot fool, you'll do crazy things. He came traveling in on a cow one day. You know, pe people will fight when they would never fight. So, so, I would, I would, so I would say you probably should stay, stay away from that as well. But listen, you must give yourself over to the situation and leave the outcome to the hands of him who judges righteously. Now, we've got an interesting story here before us this morning. And this is Mother's Day. And I don't know about you, but I remember my mom having to deal with us as kids. And, you know, sometimes, you know, depending on how many kids, you usually have, you know, a lady usually has one extra kid. That's her husband that she has to deal, deal with as well. And, uh, and I remember her dealing with us and my dad and so forth. And there's something about... A real woman, a lady, who just wants folks to get along and love one another. And it's not unusual that she is the one that is faced with the job of resolving the conflict. Conflict is not her preference. I was, I was a little brother of a teenage girl. Now, I don't know whether you had to raise little brothers of teenage girls, but little brothers usually don't know how to show love unless you just pick. You know, you just poke and pick and flip her hair and, you know, and, you know, you, you know when you're, when guys start looking at girls, you know, they usually, they'll, they'll probably say that they're ooey and, and geeky and, uh, you know, they've got uh, cooties and all this stuff, but for some reason they're just attracted to them to pick on and, you know, and you just cause problems. And I can remember my mom often having to be the referee. And there's something about moms that have an authority with their boys and the dads really, it's funny, it's, it's a different kind of authority than, than dads have. And I have often said that men are just little boys in big bodies. And I find that to be the truth. And this morning, again, we're going to see that these, we've got a couple men here are just little boys in big bodies. In fact, I have found that men often stir up the conflict instead of trying to uh, resolve it. And sometimes I think we just like a good fight. In fact, sometimes I think we like to light a fire and watch it burn. And that's not necessarily good either. Uh, in fact, you know, men don't even pay for a good, to, to, see, to see a good fight. So, I mean, we like a good fight. We want to vicariously win the battle. And too often we will ask our sons, you know, you're not going to let that boy, that kid, get, get away with that, are you? You know, and that kind of stuff. And I, however, I hate to say it again, but only by pride cometh contention. And pride is not something to be proud of, even though, as men, we often think it is. Now, we need men to be men at certain times in life. You know, sometimes you've got to kill Bambi to put food on the table. You know, sometimes you have to protect our family from intruders, protect our country from invaders. Or maybe we need to, you know, keep our, foot, our, our football team from losing. But, you know, we, we men need to be men. And I understand. I'm not, I'm not against men being men. But on the other hand, sometimes men can allow their baser instincts to get them into things they should have never gotten into. And I've often said that we would have a nasty world if it was not for the women in our lives. And I, I know it seems sometimes we can't live with them. And oftentimes it's maybe we may have difficulty understanding about them 
But the fact is, we really can't live without them. It's not good for man to be alone. God said so. And I would think he would know. He made man, and he knows what man is like. And when he says not good for man to be alone, he needs a woman, I think he knew what he was talking about. Now, I know women need to be careful and not to take charge of the house, you know, guess there. And God made man the head of the house, to, I think, to teach the woman to live by faith. And uh, she's, not, uh, she's not to usurp authority or teach over man. That's, and that's biblical, I understand that. But there is a power that a woman has over her man that only she has, and she can, without the word, make a difference in the heart of man. And uh, I want to talk about, I want to walk through this, this passage here this morning about a warm-hearted woman that headed off to murderous, hard-headed men. So let's see some, some uh, characters here this morning. Go back to your, your passage in 1 Samuel chapter 25. Verse number 2. First thing I want, I want us to see is, a, is the big shot in town. The big shot in town. 1 Samuel chap, chapter 25, verse number 2 says, There was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel. Now, you see, well, why do I put, God puts those kind of things? It doesn't mean anything. Well, it does. Maon means residence. In other words, it, he lived in a residential area. He had a nice house on the cul-de-sac, if you will, at that time. He had, he had a place where the big houses were. He had a place in the residential area of town, so to speak, and his possessions were in Carmel. Carmel is, 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 uh, is not Carmel, even though you may be hungry at this point. But anyway, Car Carmel, it means vineyards. It means orchards. It's a place of business. In other words, he worked downtown in the business dis district. And I know that sounds a little funny, but the fact is he's saying, he, you know, he had a place where out there in the country, out there where the, the houses were, and he had a nice place, but then he had his business, a little place where all the businesses were. And he says, and he was... The man was very great. Now, in the Old Testament, it talks about there was men of great renown, okay? The same type, type of word. That word great there means that he had accomplished many things, and he was well known. But it has the idea with it being kind of insolent, rude, kind of a know-it-all, a proud, too big for his britches, pushy, arrogant, a tyrant, very great, really kind of means he was a big shot and he knew it. And he liked being a big shot and he was a little pushy, kind of tyrannical about things sometimes. He, 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 he lived out town. He was, you know, he's one of these guys, old movies, you know, the big guy in the, in the, in the, in the, in the suit with, with the uh, cigar and the, show, the chauffeur and the big guy in town and walks in. Everybody says, yes, sir, Mr. Mr. Sir, and you know, with their hand out there for tips. And, and he, was, he was a big shot. In town. Now he says that he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now, I don't know whether that's all he had. It sounds like he had that many. He brought that many to town for business to shear, to get the wool off of and sell the wool. I mean, this guy was in town. Now, now, it was that time of the season when he was going to do this, which meant he was going to have a lot of money. I mean, he's, the money's flowing. They say that when they used to go when when they when the gold rush ha happened in, in California, that uh, folks would get a gold strike, and people started throwing money around. A piece of bread, you know, it would cost you a dollar for one slice of bread, and all kinds of stuff. You know, it just they everything went up. The inflation went up because people had a lot of money to throw around. Everybody else wanted to get in on it, and so he was a big shot in town. Had a lot of money. He his 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 pocket was full, and it was kind of burnt, burning a hole. And he you know is one is one of these guys that lights his, his uh, his cigar with, with uh, he'd light a dollar bill to light his cigar, you know, that, and that type of thing. I mean, he was a big shot, and he liked showing off and telling everybody how big a deal he was. He was a big shot in town. Number two, he had a beautiful wife. Beautiful wife, inside and out. Look at verse four, uh, verse three. Now, the name of the man was Nabal. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about him real, real quick here. His name was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance, but the man was curlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. Now, Nabal, that name Nabal, really means a stupid, wicked fool. 
I mean, he's just, he's just dumb. I mean, just, he, I mean he, he was smart in business. He could make a lot of money, and he thought he was clever, but it was all said and done, he was just a jerk. And he was a stupid, wicked fool. And it says he was curlish. Now, that doesn't mean he had a full head of wavy hair. All right? What, what it means is, is that uh, he, was, he was very dense about things. He was so dense about things and lacked the understanding and ability to work with people without bowling them over with his position and his power and his possessions, that he was, he was actually kind of rude and cruel and grievous and hard and hard-hearted and impudent and obstinate and stiff-necked and stubborn and just, I was all about his money. Um, I, that's a terrible thing to do, I guess, but I, I, uh, I, I, we have watched this, this show called Shark Tank, and I'm not going to even say the name. I don't really have to. But there's one particular person that's on that show almost every time, and he just has a way about him. It's all about the money. doesn't care about the people. And it's, in fact, if you, don't, if you don't do a deal with him, he says, you're dead to me. You know? And he calls everybody a little cockroach that the world's going to step on. And that's just kind of the idea of this, this guy has done well for himself, but the fact is he's just not a nice person. It, in fact, it says he was evil in his doings. That, that means spoiled. They're not, not spoiled that he had too much, although I think that's part of it, but it means rotten to the core. I mean, just spoiled till he stinks. You know, he's spoiled, he's rotten in his actions, he's an inventor of bad things, he's sleazy in his dealings, he had bad endeavors. He thinks that getting one over on another person is a good thing and wise thing, and obviously no fear of God or of the things of God, like, an, like the anointed king that we're going to see here in a moment. But... Uh, most likely disrespects goody two, two shoes, you know, they're soft, just bowl them over. Knowing the wrath of God, not only living wickedly himself, but takes joy in others to do the same. Just, just a mess. That's Nabal, the big shot in town. Now, he was married to Abigail. Now, Abigail, do you know what her name means? The source of joy. It actually means the father of joy or the progenitor of joy. No, this is where joy comes from. I mean, listen, she just knows how to bring peace and joy into the lives of others. Just a joy to be around. You, you, you've, you've come across folks like that. See, when she just walks in, the whole countenance, the whole, the whole atmosphere of the room changes. Just, just sweet and kind and tender and wants to make sure everybody's okay. And probably the only person in the world that could, probably, could even put up with Nabal. You know, just, just a good lady. And just a joy to be around. Since she was of good understanding. That means several things. One thing, she was a smart lady. She was intelligent. She was smart. She was circumspect. She, she watched what she did and how, how, and how she did it. She was uh, successful, but really but because of her discretion. She had knowledge. She had a good policy of life and how she, how, how she dealt with things. Soft-spoken. She was prudent in the way she did things, had a lot of common sense and wisdom and skillful in administering and using these attributes. Says so she was of a beautiful countenance. That really means she, this, I, I'm sorry, but it means she had an attractive outline. That's, kind of, that's what the word means. She had an attractive outline. She was a pretty lady. She was just a pretty lady and she was pretty on the inside and out. She had a good level head on her shoulders. She knew how to work with people without manipulating people or coercing them or, or trying to, you know, browbeat beat, beat them or shame them into doing something. Somehow she just knew. My mom was kind of like that. I remember when I would get myself in trouble, she'd look at me and she said, now, Sterling, you're better than that. I went, why don't you just spank me? You know, I, I would feel better. You know, just go ahead and spank me. But no, you wouldn't be, no, Sterling, you're better than that. Now, I, I'm not saying I never got spanked. She, she she didn't, she didn't beat me. She had a fly swatter. She had a little fly swatter with one of those little metal handles on it, like, like a metal um, co coat hanger, you know, you get. And, uh, and uh, man, she, she smacked that in the back of my leg, and it would sting. Wouldn't do any damage, but, boy, that thing would sting. Of course, she'd do it until the, till, till the metal would bend. But uh, she, she'd smack that thing, and, and you now, and, and uh, but, uh, I mean, never a lot. Just back, 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 back. And, she was, and that, that's all it was to it. But, uh but, and, but now I remember her saying, I'm almost rather she, she smacked me with a fly swatter than say, Sterling, you're better than that. And uh, that bothered me. I, I, I just kind of, you know, when your mom is disappointed. You know, that's just, when, when mom is disappointed, it's just hard. It's just hard. But she was of a good understanding, beautiful countenance. 
And she was meek and quiet in spirit, but was strong in demeanor and strong in character. And I can name a few of our ladies in this church as, as examples of that. And I just appreciate that. There's just something special about them. My wife being one of them. Uh, I mean, she can put up with me. So she's got to be some, something special. And uh, many women have a difficult time filling this God-given and God-ordained role, but uh, there are some who just, you know, just somehow, there's just some, something about them. Now, most likely, knowing the wisdom of Abigail, she was probably the recipient of an arranged marriage. Her beauty was probably traded by her father for the wealth of Nabal. And... Uh, I have a difficult time believing she sought out a man such as this. Back then, it wasn't unusual to have arranged marriages. And so she kind of got stuck with this guy. This was her lot in life. Great gal, married to a fool. Though, though the man of the house is the leader and the protector of the family and is responsible for the direction the family is going in, you ever notice the wife and the mother is kind of the Holy Spirit of the home? You ever notice that? She's the kind of one that sets the environment, the spirit, the warmth. She may be such as, as will have her children rise up and call her blessed. That's a virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. I hate to say it. Sometimes moms are like uh, the women in Pro Proverbs 21, 9. It's better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. Some of them are like that. But she sets the tone and the spirit of the home. She really does. If, uh, you know how it is, if mama's not happy, nobody's happy. Happy wife, ha happy life, all those kind of things. Well, the fact is, the problem is the wife and the mother needs to be happy as she determines to walk with God. A woman who walks with God does set the tone. The wife does set the tone in the home. I really believe that. And it can be a good tone or it can be a rough tone. Anyway, it says, it says, uh, Nabal was of the house of Caleb. Interesting thing here, too. Of the house of Caleb. Now, you all know the name Caleb. Caleb and Joshua were the two of the spies that went into the promised land who came back and said, you know what? God says, we, this is our land. Let's go in and take it. And 10 of them, 10, 10 of the spies said, no, we can't do it. And so they said, yes, we can. Yes, we can. And even after if, if, when they finally got into the promised land, Caleb and Joshua, there any two out of that bunch that survived the 40 years of the wilderness. And God said, I'm going to let you get into the promised land. They get into the promised land and they win some of the battles. And Caleb, when he's 85 years old, he's 85 years old, he comes up to Joshua and says, hey, you know, about, you know that mountain over there where all the giants, the Anakins live, you know? He said, well, we, we, I wanted that mountain. I still want that mountain. In fact, he said, I'm 85 years, but doggone, I'm as strong now as I was 85 years ago. I can take this thing. I think I can. And uh, he says, I want, give me that mountain. I want that mountain. I want those giants. I want to take those giants. And he was a, he was a scrappy kind of guy. And in fact, is that's what the word Caleb means. It means to dog. And have you ever, ever played with a dog? You know how a dog likes to play? Grab, grab, grab a hold of a chew toy, and then you, and you play with them, and, they, and they'll fight you and fight you and fight you, and they're having a great time, just having a good time scrapping with you, just having a good time with a little fight. They got, they got, they got their, 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 their rustlers, if you will. They, they go to it, and uh, so that's what Caleb is like. Well, what, so that, what's, what's he saying with us about him? That he's a great man of faith? No, he's saying he's a scrapper. Nabal liked a good fight, and he had that tenacity, if you will. But listen, that's a good thing if it's in a righteous person. It was a good thing in Caleb. I, I, that's why I've often said, you know, you know you, moms, dads, you know, you're raising some kids, and you say, they had a strong-willed child. Oh, my soul, I got a strong-willed child. Good. Good. Just get the will pointed in the right direction. Now, when that wheel is pointed in the wrong direction, we got a problem. And that's why you got to, you know, to do, do your best to win your, your, uh, your kids, you know, while they're young. But anyway, he was a scrapper and he was strong willed and he went in the right, right direction. That's a good thing. He was a man, he, just like Caleb, just a lot of tenacity. He's just the dog in that thing. So we got a, we got a big shot. You got a beautiful lady. 
Now we got the third guy, a big-headed boss. A big-headed boss. We have a fellow by named David. Now, David overall has been a good guy. And, he usually, and you'll see that he is a good guy. But I'll tell you what happened. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but if you were to go back to the chapter right before, remember David was being, was, had been anointed king. David had killed Goliath with his sling. And he was the next king, and Saul, the current king, knew it, but didn't like the idea. Of course, you know, the, the people were on David's side. You know, Saul has killed his thousands, but David is tens of thousands and so forth. And, and, uh, and so Saul got very jealous, and he decided he was going to hunt David down and kill him. And uh, no, I won't go into all the story, but many of you know, you know the story where Saul went, went into this cave while he was hunting down David, and uh, turned out that David and his men were already in that cave. And, David, and, and Saul went in there and says to, to cover his feet. I'm not sure. Some say it says, says it's to take a nap. Some say it was to use the restroom. I don't know. But, I think, I think it was, but anyway, he was in there kind of in a uh, precarious position. And, uh, and so David's men said, hey, this is your shot. Kill him. And uh, David doesn't. But he got so close to Saul, he actually takes his knife and slices off a part of his, his uh, robe. I said, I mean, he was, he was so close, he touched his robe, sliced off this thing, and kept it. And even then, he, David said, oh, I shouldn't have done that. But he calls down, he calls over to Saul, and, and they, when they get ready, and he, and he says, uh, he gets some distance, and says, hey, Saul, um, by the way, I could have taken you, but I didn't. And, you know, it, it, there's a certain amount of humility here, but there's a certain amount of pride. And you read through this thing, and I got a little, he got a little bit full of himself, and he said, uh, he said, listen, uh, I could have taken this, but I'm not going to, I'm, I'm too good. I'm not going to raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. I'm not going to do that. And, but mine eyes spared thee, and I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. And uh, in chapter uh, 24, verse 12, it says, The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. Just so you know, I could have done this, but I didn't. And the Lord's going to take care of you. And he knows that I was, I, was, I was being spiritual. Aren't I spiritual? And it came to pass, it says in verse 16, that when David had made an end of speaking these words, and Saul, the Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to, he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I. Saul said, David, you're, you're a better man than I am. And thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil. And it says, Wherefore the Lord reward thee good, for that thou hast done unto me this day. And now behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. I hate to say it, but I think David got a little bit of a head swell. Ah, even Saul says I'm the next king. I'm a, boy, he's, he's, he's a rough guy. I'm a pretty good guy. Yep, yeah, that's right. I'm a good guy, and I'm going to, everybody ought to know how good a guy I am. You know, I just go around doing good. That's right. I'm a, I mean, I could. I mean, I really could do a job. I could have really done a job on him, but I didn't do that. I'm a nice guy. Now look at chapter 25, verse number 4. So a typical man gets a little bit of a head swell. He's a little full of himself. I'm really, you know, I'm really, I'm quite a nice fellow. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble, you know, when you're perfect in every way. And he got, got a little bit full of himself. And look what it says in verse 4 of chapter, chapter 25. And David heard, this very next thing happened. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. Apparently he had heard about Nabal, heard he's a big shot in town. He, under, he knew who he was. And he says, huh, Nabal's down there in Carmel. Get you up to Car Carmel, he says to the young man, and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. Go down there and tell him David sent you. That'll get you a good deal. Go down and tell Nabal that David sent you. Tell him, just drop, just drop, drop my name. That'll impress him enough to give, to give you what I'm asking for. <clears throat> Verse 6. And thus shall you say to him that liveth in prosperity. In other words, 
he's living large down there. They're doing the sheep shear, and he's got all kinds of money. He's selling his wool. He's got a lot of money to, flow, the, the, the throw, to throw around right now. Tell, tell him, tell him that he that living in prosperity, peace be both to thee, and peace be to thine house, and peace unto all that thou hast, and lay it on thick. <clears throat> and now I have heard that thou hast shearers. Now thy shepherds which were with us, we hurt them not. Neither was there aught missing unto them. And all the while they were in Carmel. Now let me kind of explain this. There, it's like anything else. Human nature is human nature. When there's a lot of money flowing, there's a lot of crooks around. You know, you don't go, you don't go, you don't go to the, 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 the side of town that has no money. You rob the town that's got money. You go, you, go, you go to places where you're waiting for the, the folks with all the money come, come, coming out of, the, out of the bars at night when they're too drunk to, to defend themselves, and, and uh, that's the one that you rob. And so he said, uh, so in other words, there was going to be a, there's always a lot of marauders, if you will, or thieves around when you have shearing time because there's a lot of money to be had. And so David... You know, he, he sends his men down there, and they kind of make a wall. They kind of they gather around Nabal's bunch. And so, now Nabal didn't ask him to, but he just showed up. We're good. We're going to take care of you, Nabal. And, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of like it is. You, uh, doc, Dr. Belcher tells, tells a story about he had, he had, led, uh, he had led one of the... Uh, uh, some, a biker, but it was a biker of a not so nice group of bikers, and uh, uh, the, out, the out, outlaws, I think they were called, anyway, um, to, to the Lord. And he was someplace or other, and uh, somebody was kind of giving a little bit of pressure, and this great big biker came along and stood behind him. It's kind of like, don't mess with my preacher, you know, and so, and so he, he just took care of him. He watched over him. So the fact is, uh, David and his gang, in fact, there's 400 of them, go down there and are standing around Nabal's bunch while they're, while they're shearing the sheep. And, of course, nobody messed with Nabal's men. They didn't, they didn't mess with them at all. In verse 1, verse he says, he said, But ask thy young men, and they will show thee. He says, you know, tell them. Wherefore, let, let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. In other words, it looks like it's a good time to show up here at Nabal's house because he's got a lot of money flowing. There's, money, there's plenty of money to go, go around here. I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants and to thy, thy son David. And when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David and ceased. And basically he said, listen, uh, we took care of your men while they were shearing their sheep. And Nabal says, yeah. Well, nobody, no, no, that way there weren't any thieves. They didn't, they didn't hurt them. They were, they, were, they were protected. They were cared for. So, well, we were just kind of hoping you got a lot of, you know, there's probably plenty of food around here. We were just wondering if you just, you know, we're a little good on the hungry side. You got, any, any, got, a, got anything here we can, uh, we can uh, snack on here? It says, no. But we took care of you. Get out of here. I didn't ask you to take care of my people. Get out of here. This is Nabal speaking. All right, well, look what happens here. Two hard, two hard heads go head to head. What's this? Look at verse 10. And Nabal answered David's ser servants and said, Well, who's David? And who's the son of Jesse? Now, he says, I don't give a hoot who your boss is. But by the way, how could he know that David was the son of Jesse? And also claim he didn't know who David was. He, he knew who David was. He knew who David was. He knew who his daddy was. So he, it wasn't that he didn't know who he was. I don't know who you are. Get out of here. No. He knew who David was. In fact, we'll find out later that Abigail knew that David had been anointed king. He knew exactly who David was. But Nabal, being the jerk that he is, he says, I don't care who you're with. I don't give a hoot who David is. Whose daddy is? Get out of here. I'm not giving you anything to eat. This is our stuff. I brought this down for my men. 
There'll be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. He says, you're, you're just one of these renegades. You know, David probably, you know, I don't care if David, if, if David thinks he's been anointed king. Saul's still king, and, I'll leave, and David ought to just get out of here. They, they kind of go away from their master there. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shearers and give it unto men whom I know whence, whence they be? I know who my men are, but I don't know who you are, this guy David. I don't care who he is. So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told all these things to David. Now, by the way, there's a principle in the Bible. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. And so you got two hard-headed men, and David said, go down there and take care of them and tell them, you, you know, you, and just let them know that you, you kind of provided for them there. You, you protected them, and you ought to give us something, something to eat there. I can't afford I mean, I mean you, can't take all, you can't take all those men to McDonald's in the middle of nowhere. You know, how do you feed these guys? So there's plenty of food down there in Nabal's place. So go down there and eat with Nabal. He's got, well, he's got pl plenty to go around. He's shearing sheep. And so they go down there, and, they, and he says, get out of here. I don't care who you are. Well, they go back, and they tell David. Well, this is what he said. He said, he said we don't care who you are. Well, <laughs> nobody talks to me like that. I'm the incoming king. Look at verse 13. Do they know who they're talking to? David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword, and they girdled on every man his sword, and David also girdled on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. So we're all subject to like passions and vulnerable to our pride. I understand there. So here we are with two hot-headed men whose egos will not let them back down. We have a conflict that's not going to end well. So you got Nabal being a jerk, so I don't care what you did. I'm not going to give my money. But then you have, you have David who was kind of, you know, pre presumptuous. I said, wait a minute, you can't talk to me that way. And you, have you just, I mean, have you ever seen any schoolyard? I mean, just, I mean, just, the, I mean, it's just, just the way guys are. Well, don't, you push, <laughs> don't push me. Well, you're not going to push me. Come on. And before we know it, we've got two guys who are going head to head like, a, like, a, like two you know, two, two rams are going to ram their heads together until somebody is knocked out silly. But hey, we made our point. Problem is, David's going down there with a sword. And then enters into the scene. Wonder Woman. Truth and justice and the biblical way. A warm-hearted, level-headed, female nurturer. The real superheroes don't have to be great physical strength. But, by the way, emotional strength, spiritual strength. Look at verse 14. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master. And he railed on them. I love that word up railed. It means to swoop down on. He said it was almost like, he said, it's almost like a whole tack of wild birds. I mean, he, he, was, he, he just came on them. I mean, he just railed on them. He just one thing after another. He, I mean, it's like he hit it. We, we said we, we were looking for a little bit of food, and we would think we had knocked down a hornet's nest. Just sweep it all over us. But the men were very good unto us. I'm, I'm sorry. It says, uh, we salute, salute our master, and he railed on them. And they said, as, as you know, though we didn't ask him, ver, look at verse 15. It says, but the men, David's men, were very good unto us, and we were not hurt, and neither missed we anything as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the field. In other words, actually no one bothered us and we didn't have to fight off any cattle rustlers and horse thieves while these guys were around us, which, you know, which, which was common in the days, almost like the wild, wild west there. He said, we really were safe while they were there. We didn't ask them to be there, but we really were. It actually helped and we didn't have to do a lot of things we usually have to. And they were, it says, look at verse 6, and they were a wall unto us both day and night. All the while we were with them, keep keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all our, his household, for he is, a, he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. 
And yes, that's very, very similar to what somebody else would say these days with a slightly different term of SOB. But uh, he is, that's exactly what he's saying. I don't mean to be unkind here, but that's, that's kind of what he's saying here. And he says, that man, he said, you, in fact, he says that, that he's a man you can't even talk to the guy. You know, you didn't even talk to him. That's just the kind of guy he is. And by the way, guys, don't be that way. Do I get what I want? Yeah, and everybody thinks what they think about you too. You know, men, you know, men don't have to be like that. And, you know, David was a good man, but he let, he let his pride get a little bit overdone. And uh, he was about ready to do something very, 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 very foolish. You shouldn't put your, your family at, in, in position like that. Now, if you're, you're listen, listening to me, and I know we can have contention, but, you know, swallow your pride. Only by pride cometh contention. And we can get ourselves in a lot of trouble and cause a lot of issues. And before long, listen, we don't need to be called an, a son of Bailey, a worthless one. But level heads prevail. Remember I said a soft answer turneth away wrath. Grievous words stir up anger. We had the grievous words already, but watch what she does. Abigail sets out to cool off the situation and defuse the bomb. She makes an effort to satisfy David. By the way, this is not her problem. It's not her fault. But she realized if someone doesn't do something, somebody, somebody's going to get hurt. It's a wonderful thing that ladies can do. There's going to be a blow up and someone's going to get hurt and maybe someone's even going to die. Now, she, you're going to find out she knows who Nabal is. She knows exactly what it is. And I hate to say it probably crossed her mind. Well, you know, the only one that's probably going to die is my husband. and He's such a jerk. Maybe life would be better without him. But she doesn't say anything like that. She says, well, we've got to fix this. As stupid as he is, he's still my husband. He's still a person. I still got to take care of him. Look at verse 18. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and 100 clusters of great raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on asses, enough to feed a small army, which is what she was going to go do. Feed a small army, 400 men or more. Now, by the way, just, just so you say, so how, why, why is she going to take two bottles of wine? Because you use the uh, wisdom, mingles her wine. The wine was used to, the alcohol was in there to use to kill the parasites and the bugs and the junk in the water. It waters it down, so it prepares the drinks. You don't need a bottle of wine per guy. It was just enough to, to, to sanitize the water so they could drink. She's a wise woman. Otherwise, you got all these hot-headed men, you're going to make them drunk. Yeah, that'll work. You know, they do, do, do stupid things when they're mad in the first place. Now let's just get them drunk. That, that'll, that'll, and then they're really going to have a level head. No, you don't do that. No, she was a smart lady. And she said unto her servants, Go on before me, verse 19. Behold, behold I come after you. But she told not her husband, Nabal. And it was so, as she rode on the ass, that she came down by the cover of the hill. And behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. So she's coming down the hill with all these, with these animals, with all loaded down with food. And she meets up with David. Now, watch this. Learn some things from this. I wish I could, I could apply all this. I'm not going to have time to do that, but I want you to see this. So here we got David. He's steaming. He's fuming. And I'm sure she could see the rage in his eyes. He's got 400 men with swords and an attitude. And here she shows up with her couple donkeys, and some food. Look at verse 21. Now David had said, Surely in vain I have kept, that, kept all that this fellow hath in wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that, he, that pertained to him. And he hath requited me evil for good. He had said that. You know what he was doing? He was, he was, he was, color, he was probably muttering to himself coming down the hill with his guys. Oh, he's not going to treat me like that. I can't believe he said that. Man, look what Ephraim I did to that. And, look, and this is the way he treats me. I, I, this, I'm going to show him a thing or two. Well, if you were so worried about protecting him, now do you want to, why, why do you want to kill him? You're going to do to him 
probably worse than what the thieves would have done. So he, he, his heart wasn't necessarily real pure here. But he says, I'm going, I go out of my way to, make, make, to be a nice guy. And, and, uh, and this ingrate turns around and slaps me in the face. I'm a nice guy, and this is a thanks I get. That's what's going through his brain. And again, by the way, guys, sometimes we're not careful. We, get, we throw a pity party. If someone doesn't treat us quite right, we're ready to smack them down. Wrong, 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 wrong. Verse 22. So and more also do God unto the enemies of David. In other words, he doesn't know who he's messing with, but I'm about to teach him a lesson, and he's going to find out who he's messing with. And if I leave all that pertain to him by the morning light, any that pits against the wall, and he said, and so he said, nobody is going to treat David, David, the anointed next king of Israel, going to treat him like here. God won't allow it. You don't treat me like this. And I'm, listen, I am just and angry with righteous indignation. By the way, you notice that when somebody else gets angry, it's sin. When you get angry, it's righteous indignation. You ever notice that? Yeah, well, that's what David said. But cooler heads prevail. Verse 23. When Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass and fell before David. Look at that. She fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be, and let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. In other words, take this out on me rather than Nabal. I was the one that failed to have enough food prepared for his men and your men. Now, that's not really true. But she says, I'll take I'll take the blame here. And then basically she says, my husband's not really good, 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 good around the house. <laughs> he says, verse, verse 25, let, let not my Lord, I pray, that regard this man of Belial, even Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. It means fool. My husband, in other words, put, he, puts, he puts his mouth in gear and, and he forgets to get his brain up and running. And, you know, this, this, that's all right. Don't... Nabal is his name, and folly is his game. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord whom thou didst send. I didn't see that. I didn't know they were there. And if I had been here, I would have made sure everybody had some, something to eat. I'm sorry. I, I just kind of dropped the ball. Na, you know, Nabal doesn't deal with that kind of stuff. I, I should have done that. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. In other words, Nabal's an idiot that really has no clue of what's going on, and let's, let's, let's just keep our enemies in the dark, too, about what has transpired rather than following through with a hasty action here, David, that we're gonna, that's going to come back to haunt you later. Uh, it's a kind of a confusing way of saying that Nabal's really your enemy, but God will deal with him because God has to make sure you become king. And if Nabal didn't mean anything by this, and he's not your enemy, then you will be guilty of shedding innocent blood, and that's not going to do, do you well. Look at verse 27. And now this blessing which thine hand, handmaid hath made, brought unto my Lord, let it even be unto thee, the young man that follow my Lord. So here's some food for young men. I hope it's enough, and I hope you will forgive this whole mess and misunderstanding. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid. In other words, I'm sorry I wasn't prepared to take care of your men because I'm sure your men kept my husband's men safe by your presence with them, and, and I'm sure... You meant well by doing so. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord, look it, make Lord a sure house because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord and evil hath not been found in thee in all thy days. We know that you've been anointed to be the king and that you know, you've, you've been known for being fair and honest and full of integrity and this is not your usual way of dealing with things. And yet a man has risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul, but the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God and the souls of thine enemies, then shall ye sling out as the middle of a sling. In other words, I know that Saul is trying, is seeking your life, but God has bundled you up. He's, he's got you all kept up. He's got you all cared for, and he's not going to cast you away, but he's going to cast away your, your enemies just like a sling. And I know, David, you know all about slings. You know how those things work. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done, my Lord, according to all that good that he hath spoken concerning thee. 
and have, shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel, that this incident, this potential unfortunate discretion he's about ready to do, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either thou hast shed blood costless, or, that thou, or my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. God will take care of you and was going to throw your enemies away like a stone from a sling. And I know you know all about that. And when you become king, the other political party won't have anything to get against you, to discredit you. I mean, in other words, he kind of kept said, you know, David, uh, you probably don't want to do this. She kind of said it in a, in a very nice way. You said, you're smarter than this, David. I'm glad you know how to stop so that you won't do this and do some things that's going to come back to haunt you later when uh, everybody's got to find out that David's a murderer, just goes around murdering people like Nabal for no, no good reason. And, uh, and so I'm just glad that you got stopped. You, know, you, see, you, you see how she did this? You're better than this, David. But in a very nice way, in a very kind way, very respectful way. So here she is, this rose between two thorns. Well, David learns his lesson. David heard that Nabal was dead. He said, well, let me go, let me go back here. Let me go back here. He swallows his pride. The soft answer has turned away wrath. Verse 32, and David said to Abigail, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. And blessed be thy advice. And blessed be thou which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hast hasted and come to meet me, surely there had not been left in the Nabal by, one, by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. So David received of her hand that which she had brought him and said unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice and have accepted, accepted thy person. What's he saying? I don't take this wrong, but there was a little difference in society at that time, and the men and the women and so forth. But he says, I hear what you said, and I'm listening. You're a smart lady. I'm going to do what you said you said to do. So David puts the situation back in the hands of the Lord. And by the way, Nabal's drunk as a skunk. And she goes and tells Nabal the next morning what was about to happen. And when he finds out that David was coming with 400 men, I, he, apparently he had a heart attack or a stroke or something, but he, was, he almost went to stone. Basically, in about 10, 10, 10 days, he finally died. And that was it. Nabal was gone. And the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Nathan read Psalm 73 a little while ago. So you may want to go back and reread that. Asaph said, "I was listen. I was my my slipped to na my my feet of na uh, near nearly uh, slipped away. I perished, but I found out what the truth is. I went to church, went to the sanctuary that of the Lord, and I found out the end of those who sin. God takes care of them. I just need to do right." So David learns his lesson. Now, to resolve conflict, to get all done, it's time to get out of here. So, listen, we saw two hard-headed men, but a very wise woman who was able to resolve this conflict. Let me give you a real quick couple things. Don't become proud and self-righteous in yourself. Stay humble. Stay humble. Keep a level head. Speak softly. But you know what? When you're trying to diffuse the conflict, it's the same thing. Stay humble. Don't get condescending. Don't become self-righteous. Keep a level head. Speak softly. Don't accuse or demand. 1 Peter 3 says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that in any obey not the word, they may also without the word, look at that, 
be won by the conversation of their wives, the lifestyle, the habit of life, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting of, of the hair, wearing of gold, or putting of apparel. Let it be the hidden man of the heart, that which is not corruptible, even an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And so some ladies go, oh, well, so I'm supposed to be humble. Well, we got, I got some arrogant husband who's going to mouth off. Well, he shouldn't be arrogant. shouldn't be mouthing off. But I tell you what, a soft answer will turn, turn away wrath. Sure, it's hard. So I'm supposed to be the spiritual one. Well, yeah. You know what? Jesus was the spiritual one. The Bible says that he's the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but the sins of the whole world. That, that word propitiation means amends. He makes amends. He's the one who says, now God, in your justice, you, you, you could be sending these folks to hell for the wage of sin is death. Now the fact is, do you realize that God has the power, authority, that he could just send you all to hell because of your sin? The fact is, you shouldn't be alive right now because he could have taken your life just like that. But if you're still alive, which means he's still giving you a chance. Because he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, because our righteousnesses are even as filthy rags. But God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God wants to make this right. Now, he's willing to make it right if you're willing to make it right. Now, God, you're willing to make it right if he's willing to make it right. Is that correct? So, so here it is, Lord. I am Jesus talking. I'm going to take the brunt of this. I want to make this right. I'm going to do so at my expense, my inconvenience, my hurt. And so Jesus, just like Abigail, stood between two. The righteous had been wronged. And some of us had thumbed our, our, our nose at the righteous. But Jesus says, I'll pay the debt. Will you accept the debt? You accept the payment. Now, will you accept the payment? You got to admit that you're wrong. You got to admit that you can't pay it yourself. But I'll make the amends. And Jesus Christ takes his hand in his hand and brings reconciliation. And we have that ministry of reconciliation. You know, ladies, <clears throat> we can be pretty hard-headed sometimes. <clears throat> But it's amazing what ladies can do to calm us down. And guys, you shouldn't have to wait for that. So ladies, be respectful, outwardly, inwardly. When you try to make things right, guys, you need to do the same thing. In fact, we all should be the amends maker, not the troublemakers. Rose between two thorns. Jesus, the rose to share, the reconciler, the amends maker. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, Jesus has taken care of, of the penalty. David said, you know what? You're right. I'm wrong. And yet Nabal said he didn't want to give up. He was just afraid of the 
punishment to come. He lost his life. You have a choice. And we're thankful that Christ is our amend maker. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for speaking to us here this morning. <clears throat> thank you for this, uh, this dear lady Abigail who gives us the, the picture of graciousness and mercy. The sweetness of the Rose of Sharon, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who stood in the gap and made amends so a life would not be lost. Lord, I pray that you will I will see our need for a Savior and receive, this, receive, and receive the life that you have for us and the forgiveness. And Lord, I pray that you'll be with our ladies. Thank you so much for our ladies, for the love that they show. And Lord, give our ladies uh, wisdom, understanding, grace and peace to do what they need to do. And men, may we stand before God having been righteous not hot-headed, not proud or arrogant. Realize we are what we are, where if there's anything that's good about us is by the grace and mercy of God. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our hearts of our lives. Be with us here now. Give us a good afternoon, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. I appreciate you being with us here this morning. God bless you. And if you were, if you made a... a, 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 a Decision for Christ, we would love to hear about it. You can email us there at uh, info at lighthousebapt.org. You can also sign up for the book. We'll be back tonight at 6 o'clock, and I want you to be here with us. Of course, Wednesday at 7 o'clock. God bless you. Happy Mother's Day. We'll see you next time. Bye.